Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Daniel Gaughan, who's a professor at the University of Sao Carlos in Brazil. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bart. It's great to be in your show. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, I, I want to say up front that you were recommended by Matt Brennan, who's a great friend of the podcast and uh, has done some really cool episodes himself. Um, and you were a contributor to the Cambridge Companion to the Drum Kit, which Matt also, you know, which Matt put together. And I, uh, Mandy Smith, who was on the podcast recently, had a great uh, chapter in it. But so Matt got us in contact because today we're going to be talking about the history of the drum kit in Brazil and also just about Brazilian drumming and the influences and how it kind of worked in America and and, and just everything about Brazilian drumming. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm like I said, I'm really, really happy to have you here. This is a bit out of my comfort zone because I'm kind of it's kind of a foreign topic to me, but I think uh, you're the man for the, for the episode. So. What just start with how you would pretend like you're teaching a class to a bunch of people like myself, maybe who don't know anything really about it beyond seeing videos of some amazing drummers. Go ahead and tell us all about it. Well, before anything else, thanks for having me, you know, sure. Uh, for a long time, Bart, we had this label of Latin music, mm -hmm. you know, and we would get uh, drum charts or drum transcriptions even that would say Latin, and then you look at that and say, oh, you know, I have to play a samba. And maybe it could be, you know, a bayang or a maracatu or, or Afro-Cuban music or something from Argentina or Colombia. So sure. very frequently they would use their, the very large umbrella of Latin for many different types of music, you know? So it's, yeah. it's great that I have the chance here and in the book, you know, to uh, show some of our drum heroes because you know? of yeah. course each country has its history its tradition its drum heroes you no know, yeah. special qualities so yeah. the idea behind this chapter uh, for the cambridge companion to the drum kit book was first uh you know to uh, show some of our history and then discuss uh, what makes our drumming special you know uh, yeah what's the brazilian feel yeah Absolutely. And and I just want to throw in that, like, so in my uh, posting videos on social media, which is what I do for the drum history, social media stuff, I every time I post a Brazilian drummer and it gets a ton of views and the Brazilian, um, you know, fans of the podcast or on social media who like the videos are so passionate. And so it's it's a next level beyond going, oh, I like that drummer. I like Neil Peart. Thanks for posting this video, whatever, like a, like a, you know, Canadian or American guy. It is like a, uh, an unbelievable level of passion that I've found that Bra Brazilian drummers have for their legends. And I always get met if, if anyone passes away, I get a message saying today we lost this Brazilian great. Can you please share a video of it? And if, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So the, the drummers and the people in Brazil, I, I have noticed are incredibly passionate about their heroes that's true that's true however you know i'm really i'm a little concerned about the future because if you go here you know in my city and ask like 10 teenagers about brazilian music i would say that at least nine you know they have no idea what happened in previous decades mm. yeah you know, maybe one or two would say okay antonio carlos jobin a uh, girl from ipanema you know, they would have like some superficial knowledge. Yeah. But, you know, so that's why I think it's so important to discuss our history. Right. Absolutely. So, and then in that chapter, I think it, that's a good starting point, I think, is we have an overview there. I mean, of course, history can get very complex, but I had things just for the sake of making things easy to understand. I had like three uh, groups, you know, I, a first generation with the pioneers, then a second generation uh, with drummers uh, from Bossa Nova and Samba Jazz, like in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And then a third group that I call modern players. You know, sure. Of course, if we go deeper, we can get you know maybe a third generation in the 70s, another generation in the 80s. 
So yeah. it's just a general overview to make things easy to understand. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I'd say let's jump in. And and as we go, I'd love to hear about because this chapter title being the 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 drum kit in Brazil is like to me, it's like you think of the drum kit, you think of bass drum, snare, two toms and a floor tom, which isn't usually uh, the case when you go around the world of having that kind of like, I don't know, that traditional like, let's say the jazz drum set that evolved into the rock drum set, which there are a lot of drummers who use that. But I feel like in Brazilian, you know, music, it evolved a lot more and there's a lot of, uh, you know, accessories on the kit and stuff. But yeah, so take it back as far as you can and kind of sh- tell us about the the beginnings of uh, the drum kit or whatever in, in Brazil. Well, we're, we're thinking about the drum kit, you know, with the drum pedal, with that. Sure. Uh, so the drum kit arrived in Brazil around 1920, probably a few years before that. We will never know for sure, of course. Yeah. Uh, but what, what we do know is that during the 1920s, there were jazz bands in Brazil. You know, hmm. jazz bands being any band with a drum kit would be called a jazz band. And then these bands would play, of course, jazz, you know, American music, which was big here at the time, yeah. uh, but also Brazilian music, you know, machixe, samba, uh, tango from Argentina. And, you know, we have also to remember that Samba was being developed at the time. You know, mm-hmm. we had Mojinha, we had Lundu and Mashishi, three different rhythms that came together to form Samba. And that was at that time. You know, we have a landmark in 1917. That's when we had the first recorded Samba, uh, Pelo Telefone by Donga, composition by Donga. And that wow. was a big hit in the carnival of 1917. So dr- drummers at the time, they were learning about this new instrument, you know, the drum kit and, and American music. How do I play this? And also they were thinking about how to adapt our rhythms to the drum kit. So the yeah. first thing was actually to use sounds, concepts, ideas from the hand percussion instruments that we have here in Brazil uh, applied to the drum kit. Right? Mm. I mean, not, not only the patterns, but also the sounds. You know, they would go for the sounds. So, for instance, uh, when we think about Luciano Perroni, which is like the first drum hero then we can, we can discuss here, sure. Luciano Perroni used to play the snare drum with the snares off. And he would play with the stick in his right hand and his left hand would muffle the sound. You know, he was going for the sound of the hippiniki, which is a hand mm. percussion instrument that we have in Brazil. So he would go like, and he would yeah. muffle the sound with the left. So that would not be possible to achieve with two drumsticks. You know, he was going always for yeah. the sound. Interesting. And that's just how you, how it evolves. That's taking what you see, but you got to do what you got to do to make it work with your style. And I just think that's so cool to think about these, uh, these drummers in Brazil in the 1920s, just taking this. I mean, I think jazz, a lot of people say is the greatest American export, even though it has origins that go back further and all that stuff. But uh, it's so neat to think about that. And even I, I like to, you know, I, I imagine they would, you think of jazzers in the 20s wearing, you know, suits and things like that. And the style, was that being applied? Do you think they had the aesthetic that they were like, I, I even think everything would be taken from this early jazzer style and just look cool in Brazil. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, well, at that time, you know, everything American was was valued. And the same thing happened again. In, in the 50s, you know, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Sure. But more than, than the style, you know, they were, they were just trying to understand the music, I think. Yeah. You know, so we had all of these drummers in the book. I mentioned like Valfrido Silva, Juquinha, uh, Plinio Araújo, Faísca, Suti. I mean, there are many names. And then, of course, it's a shame we don't have, you know, we might have a, a photograph, but we don't have yeah. 
videos or, or good recordings of them. Yeah. And that's why, you know, the, our first big drum hero is Luciano Perroni. He was the guy, you know, he was called the, the father of Brazilian drumming. Although hmm. he was not the first one, he was the father of Brazilian drumming. And Luciano Perroni was so important that he was compared to, uh, to Gene Krupa in jazz. Oh, wow. You know? Like Gene Krupa had Sing, Sing, Sing in the 30s. Mm -hmm. In 1931, uh, Luciano Perroni recorded the first drum solo in a song, you know, uh, Faceira. And wow. it wasn't like an extended drum solo. It was like a short break. But sure. for the first time, you know, people would say the other instruments might stop and the drummer will have something to say. You know, that was yeah. very meaningful for the time. Yeah. I mean, you take it for granted what we have now of like, you know, just drummers doing whatever they want. But um, and I feel like it's uh, when I think of Brazil, it's a very like like we've you were saying it's very rhythmic culture. It makes sense that drums would be in the forefront there. Um, but it's kind of neat to hear that that was the first example of it. Like it wasn't before, you know, with, with the more modern quote unquote recording techniques, uh, you know, I, I always wonder how that would have, would have happened. I wonder if he spoke up and said, I'm going to take, give me four measures to do a little drum fill, or if it just kind of fell into place, you know, who, who knows? Yeah, true. But the thing is, you know, drummers at the time, remember uh, there were no drum teachers, right? Sure. And, 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 so they were, I think, always trying to find their ways, you know. So just imagine, look, uh, Luciano Perroni. I mean, he was, you know, he was born, uh, let me think, 19, 1908. Mm. And, and when he started his career, he was playing, uh, you know, sound effects in, in movie theaters for oh, silent cool. movies. Actually, yeah. we, do, we do know that his first job was playing for the Charlie Chaplin movie, The Kid, you know, so a long time wow. ago. And, and then, you know, after that, he was playing in radio. Then uh, something I, I show in the book is that he had a partnership with Hadames Nyatali, which was a very important piano player, composer, and arranger, uh, at the time, in the 30s. And in 1936, they started working at the radio, uh, Radio Nacional, the national radio in Rio de Janeiro. And so then at the time, you know, they, they had only the drum kit to play uh, all those rhythms. So they had to find a way to get all the percussion parts uh, just with the drum kit. So yeah. Hadamas Natali was very helpful uh, with Luciano Perroni to think about that. And the other way around too, you know, people say that Luciano Perroni was fundamental in helping uh, Hadamas Natali to develop his arranging uh, style. Just mm -hmm. like uh, he, he was the one who suggested that Hadamas should use you know, percussion figures for the horn arrangements. So, you know, he was very important wow. all around. I mean, just a very relevant figure for our, our drumming. Yeah, it sounds like it. And could you maybe describe a little bit about, like, you know, the brands or, or things like that, of, like, what a drum set would be, uh, you know, would consist of in Brazil in the 30s, the 20s? Were these, I'm assuming, I mean, it would be... Um, like here in America, you would have your Ludwigs and your Slingerlands and things like that. But that obviously was, you know, and even in when when I talk to people in Europe, it's like it's not as easy. You don't go to a music store and pick up a Ludwig kit. It's an import. It doesn't really work like that. What type of brands and drum sets and symbols were people typically using back then that, you, that you're aware of? You know, that's something that I'm really not. Uh, aware sure. of, I mean, okay. brands and things like that. Okay. But what we do know is that uh, actually Luciano Perroni talks about this, this, our first drum hero. He, he mentions that when he started playing at Radio Nacional, uh, they, you know, they still had just a snare drum uh, on, on a chair mm -hmm. and a, 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 a bass drum and a floor tom. I mean, he would play cymbals, but not that much. I mean, that's something yeah. that 
came later. I mean, they would use symbols for some accents, but there was no thing, such a thing like, oh, I'm going to ride, yeah. you know, keeping time on keeping a symbol. Time. Yeah, that, that came later. You know, sure. at that time, uh, and I'm going to discuss samba here mostly, okay. of course, you know, we have other Brazilian rhythms, but I think samba is the most representative one. And that's the one I use in the book. Mm -hmm. So at that time, they were playing uh, that first generation of drummers. They were playing the samba batucada. Uh, so meaning that they were just emulating the hand percussion instruments. So like they would play quarter notes with the bass drum mm -hmm. and play first, they would play everything in the snare. Then a later development was that they would cross over the left hand on top of the right hand and play the floor tone. Hmm. So that uh, the right hand would be playing on the snare, all those syncopated rhythms. And the left hand would be on the floor tone playing the surda part. Hmm. So like beat one would be muffled, beat mm -hmm. two would be an open assing, like two, 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 yeah. You know, so complex stuff, but they were very, you know, developing everything, you know, on the go. Yeah. I mean, there is something uh, that is just mind boggling to me a lot about Brazilian rhythms and things. And I think a lot of people like American drummers where you're just not brought up with it. You're not born with it, where I mean, it is so complex and it is so hard to just comprehend. But it seems like that is just a part of your culture. You, 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 if you grow up listening to it, it has to just be more natural to you. I mean, cause for me, I mean, I'm, you know, 31. It, I guess you could spend a lot of time to practice and learn it, but if you raised with it, I guess it makes a lot more sense than just, you know, trying to listen to it kind of as a, a newcomer to the music and just go, oh, I can't, <laughs> this is really hard to follow. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. and, and a big part of my research in recent years has been to understand what is the Brazilian feel, you know, and why, you know, it's not that only Brazilians can play Brazilian music. I mean, I can mm -hmm. name, you know, some great Americans, like if you listen to Mark Walker or mm -hmm. Ricky Sebastian, I mean, there are so many American drummers who can sure. play great Brazilian feel, but then it's very often that you see, you know, drummers trying to play and they just it's it's not there you know mm -hmm. so uh i've been trying to understand what does the brazilian feel and and it's hard to explain it it's i'm not saying that yeah. i can't explain it but at least you know i've been trying i've been thinking about yeah. it. yeah do you think that so where i mean and i'm so don't want to like generalize which i'm glad you just said that where there's a lot of great american drummers who can sure. play that style but do you think that so I think of growing up as an American, you 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 kind of like you learn jazz, you learn rock and roll, you learn that kind of, I don't know, more a lot of times I would say compared to the Brazilian, the 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 Latin rhythms, which again I don't want to generalize anything, but you you know what I mean, where um for Brazilian drummers, is it sometimes they're not their first instinct isn't to play a basic torn down two four boot. Bop, boop, bop, beat with a song. Where for a, you know, an Amer the America side of thing, you kind of think that sometimes you play a very basic rhythm and it fits perfectly with the song. Does that make sense? That like, do you think that's not the instinct for Brazilian drummers to go that basic route? It's to be more embellished. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, it does. But I think things are different now because you know we have all of this information floating around. We have, uh, you know, so many. Brazilian drummers nowadays, they don't learn Brazilian rhythms as the first thing. Sure. You know, good point. But um, I think when we think about instinct, okay, so w when we think about the Brazilian feel, I think we have to consider at least three basic elements. And I don't want to get, you know, too, uh, yeah. like, in a lesson here, but I think it's, <laughs> it would be interesting to discuss this. So we have to consider note placement, uh, technique, how you develop your technique, and, and the cultural environment, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so note placement, and I'm going to, again, think about samba, you know, and, but many of the 
other Brazilian rhythms are also based in, on 16th note variations. So the same ideas would apply. So in samba, we have 16th notes, but the space between them is not even, mm. right? We have like irregular spacing between the notes. Sure. And the best scientific description I've found for this is that like there are rhythm uh, fluctuations in a flexible net, you mm. know? So, so you have some fixed points uh, giving you a pulse, like a structure, but you have, sure. the, you have the flexibility of the net. And, and that's why, you know, uh, it's so hard to grasp those rhythms because every measure is a little different from the measure before what you yeah. just played. And, you know, and that's why it's so hard to put that into music notation. So you have, you know, books and in, in, in books it's very common to say, oh, this is samba. And you have mm -hmm. that pattern for the feet, you know, the ostinato. Dum, ch -dum, dum, ch -dum, dum. Yep. So, uh, you know, a sequence of dotted eighth notes, a 16th note with the bass drum, high hi hat on the upbeats. Mm -hmm. And then for the hands, you play an accent the first and on the fourth. Uh, of of all the sixteenth notes, ta 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 ta. But if you play that as written, you know, or if you program that in a computer, that's not samba, you know. So you <laughs> yeah, have a lot, sure. you have a lot of misinformation. Like oh, I'm going to play a samba for you now, and okay, you're playing in a pattern. That's just a pattern, but it's not really samba. I mean, the samba comes from the feel, from that irregular spacing. So yeah. it, it's just like jazz. You know, you have the micro timing. Mm -hmm. uh thing going on but in jazz you're, you're thinking in triplets and in samba you're thinking in 16th notes but mm. you have like it's almost like you have a triplet inside the 16th note so yeah you know but anyway you, you have to consider sure. note placement that's number one number two would be technique like how how do you learn to play the instrument like bart if i ask you in your experience you know a drummer learning to play the drum kit like to develop hand technique mm -hmm. uh what do how do they do it what what do they practice i mean i would say you start i would say go through a basic book <laughs> of like syncopation or something but honestly i would say from having a, a young son who's tr trying to pick up the drumsticks you just start playing. You have to get comfortable playing with the sticks. I mean, I hope that's sort of the right answer. Yeah, I mean, th actually the answer I was looking for is like, you show, you no, know, these are the sticks, you know, this is how you hold the sticks, let's play a sure. single stroke roll. Exactly, right? yes, yeah. Let's play a single stroke roll. I mean, from, from that moment on, you're thinking rudiments. Sure. Right, it's like you show, when you show, the single stroke row, you say, you know, you have to place each stroke evenly and, you know, keep your dynamics equal, a perfect balance between your hands, like yep. same movements, uh, you know, stick height, same height, everything should, you're striving for, uh, you know, evenness, symmetry, almost like mathematical perfection you know exactly you're yeah you're, you're trying to be perfect and then of yeah. course after you get your technique you can play around with that you can you know play with swing and do different things but you're actually teaching your brain in your hands to be perfect you know to you know divide everything in two or three equal parts yeah and of course, in Brazil, you know, we learn rudiments and we practice them. But when we learn uh, Brazilian rhythms, uh, traditionally, we're not looking at music notation. You know, we're always trying to copy uh, an older, more experienced player. Hmm. You know, we, uh, we're trying to emulate those sounds. And then, you know, funny things happen. Yeah. For instance, uh, when you think about uh, some snare drum variations for samba schools, and there's a great book. Uh, it's not here, but I have a great book from my friends, uh, uh, 
Bajo, Fernando Bajo, and Diego Zangados, called Samba na Bateria. They have all these uh, samba school variations for the snare drum. It's very common that you're going to play every accent or almost all accents with your strong hand, with your dominant mm. hand. So yeah. let's say I'm, I'm right-handed, I'm going to play everything with my right hand, and the left hand will be there just for some rhythmic support, okay? And yeah. actually, there's an explanation for this. Uh, you know, in the early days, uh, during the carnival parade, uh, police would be around, you know, looking for people playing percussion instruments because that was not something, you know, people with good reputation would do. So, uh, <laughs> the bad so, boys. <laughs> so, so the way uh, they would hold the drum would be like this. I mean, they would hold, hold the drum uh, with the left arm, like against the chest. Yep. And they would play with the right hand with the stick. And there's a, just a short stick. You know, you can look on YouTube. Uh, there's sure. a ton of videos and, and pictures of that. So there's a very short stick here. You can't play, really play accents with that. I mean, just huh. have some rhythm support. You know, wow. So uh, the explanation is that they would use the snare drum actually to hide their faces from the police. You know, they're playing. So wow, that's what that came from. That's, that's so what. cool. <laughs> so I mean, we have another example with the alfaya. If you think about the alfaya, it's. Uh, uh, a drum, uh, you know, large drum, very common in maracatu groups. So if you look at pictures, people playing that, or you know, if you see the videos, everything is played with the strong hand. The yeah. other hand has a grip, you know, it's something like, like this. You know? Sure. You cannot really play uh, accents with that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I've seen uh, classically trained percussionists, like very great musicians trying to copy young kids in maracatu groups, and they could, could not do it. I mean, I wrote about that in books, like they could not do it because, as I said in a book, like they, their rudimental DNA was too yeah. strong, you know? They know too much. They, they, they're too set in their ways, I guess. Th their technique, it's just too perfect. Yeah. Right? So it's yeah. very hard, I guess, to get out of that and play wrong, you know, to play yeah. with this. So when you just copy, you go for the sound. You're not thinking about things. You go for the sound. So number one, uh, uh, note placement. Number two, technique. Number three, the cultural environment. You know, as you said, growing up in Brazil, and I'm sure things are different now because, you know, the internet, uh, people spend their whole day on Netflix or whatever. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, when I was growing up, you're immersed in, in the music most of the time. Sure. Like in, during Carnival, it was just impossible to escape. You know, there was samba everywhere. You would, you know, you turn on the TV, samba on every channel. Then you yeah. go to a supermarket, samba. You go to, a, you know, a restaurant. Then even if you, if you hate it, like you, you say, I'm going to hide in a cave for a month. <laughs> You know, most likely someone were going to show up with a Pandaris and here's some samba for you, you know? In your cave, yeah. It, it's just not possible. It's, you know, yeah. impossible to escape. So, you all the time, you're watching people, how people walk, how people talk, you know, speak Portuguese. Portuguese has mm -hmm. a certain rhythm. How people, you know, you understand about the religion. Uh, you And very importantly, you... Uh, watch people dancing because the regular the regular spacing between the notes it's filled with body motion mm -hmm. and here's the thing when we watch someone you know in a samba school parade uh going down the avenue and playing you see that whatever he's doing when he's not playing is as important as you know the patterns because yeah. that's actually part of the pattern so you mm. know so if you consider all these things and i'm not saying that this is 
easy to explain, you know? So sure. I, I do discuss some of this in the Cambridge Companion to the, the Drum Kit book, but I felt that this was so, uh, you know, complicated that I actually wrote another article, another piece of work, uh, which was published in the, in the most recent issue of the Journal of Popular Music Education. Hmm. And, and the most recent issue was uh, dedicated only to drum kit studies. So it, I think it's oh, wow. a very cool magazine to, to have a look yeah, at. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's what you're saying, though, is, is, is I, part three, the cultural environment where you're trying to, which you're doing a great job doing it, but you're trying to teach something or write something that when in, in actuality you, you grow up in it and you can't escape it, it's in your blood it's hard to explain in words to someone who's literally, who's never been to the country and who doesn't understand it. But I think you're doing a great job, but I think at, at the, the core of it, you kind of, it's just, it's a part of you. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, but, yeah. You know, I have to say, like, I think we get that information, Yeah, but I, I think we have not been doing a good job of keeping our history. You know, mm. like yeah. if you think about jazz, you know, you have all these universities, you have, uh, you know, a lot of people would know that in the 30s, you had the big bands, and mm -hmm. you know, the names, and then okay, in the 40s, we had the bebop. And I know yeah. some of the names. So you have that structure, you know, sure. people who like jazz, who enjoy jazz, would know, uh, you know, their favorite musician, where they came from. Like, oh, fusion, it, it, you know, in the 70s, we have this group and that. Yeah. But in Brazil, just like, uh, even though I got that information, I, I had records at home, like just now, you know, when I had my academic research going on, then I went back to look, you know, who were these drum heroes? Because yeah. I, I had heard of them. But we, we don't really have material. You know, just now, in recent years, we see here at the university, you know, a lot of research. So this is, is good news. I mean, but this has been happening for the past maybe 10 years, you know, 15 years. So we have publications. So you have material. You can find good material about that. But, you know, that's recent. Yeah. And then you have to have the desire for the next generation to not be as interested in doing stuff on their computer and playing the drums a little bit. You need to really be into it on every level to go deep and learn your background. But uh, I think you, what, what we're doing right now is a cool way to get it's approachable and it's, it's interesting and it's, it's fun. Uh, and it might whet people's appetite for wanting to learn more. Um, which I think is great. And especially because you think back to, and, and I mean, on, on that note, so getting back kind of on the timeline, I think it's really cool where you left off with, and I'm not going to butcher any names, but you left off with the drummer where he, the first drum solo, I think is where we left off on the timeline. I'd Lu love to carry on. Sure. Luciano Perroni, right? Okay. He was the guy. Uh, yeah. So Luciano Perroni was like the first big name, the father of Brazilian drumming. He played in a ton of great recordings. Like in 1939, he played in the first recording of Aquarela do Brasil. You know, if you think Brazil, I mean, that Aquarela do Brasil, that's so huge, you know, so important. Yeah. And, and at this point, before I move on, I really should pay tribute to Oscar Bolão. You know, great, wonderful drummer who just passed away. Yes, like, rest in peace, yeah. A few days ago. And Oscar Bolão, he was a student of Luciano Perroni. He took mm. lessons with him. And he was carrying the tradition of the samba batucado. You know, and, and we're going to see that we had a certain tension between samba batucada and the styles that came later on. Mm. And Oscar Bolão... He was a great drummer, and, and, and he wrote a book called Batuque é um Privilégio. Batuque is a privilege. And this book, it's Portuguese, English. So anyone listening here, you know, might enjoy that book. I highly recommend it. Go check okay. it out. If you want to learn about Brazilian music, it's great material. You know? Cool. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're 
we stopped with samba batucada, right? And that's the way most drummers were playing throughout the 30s and the 40s. And things changed with what I'm calling here the second generation. You know, this is my thing. It's not, oh, you know, that drummer is from of the course. second. But just sure. so that we helps, have... It helps to categorize it, yeah. We, we have the timeline. First generation, yep. the pioneers. The second generation came in the 50s. So in the 1950s, we had a president in Brazil called Juscelino Kubitschek. And, and that president, you know, his slogan, his, his thing was, you know, we're going to have 50 years in five. He really wanted, you know, to take our economic development to a step further, to, you know, improve our infrastructure. So yeah. anything that was like new technology, modern things coming from the U.S., you know, all of that was highly valued. Hmm. So... Uh, in music, we had like a dilemma. We had people saying we should preserve our traditions and we should keep our music, you know, the, the way it is. Yeah. And some other people thought, you know, we should be listening to everything happening around the planet and we should use that influence, you know, to our benefit. So uh, a new style of playing samba uh, evolved, and that was the samba no prato, or samba that you ride, you know, on the ride symbol. Sure. And uh, the drummer that became known as the creator of that was Edson Machado. He's our second drum hero, Edson Machado. You know, we have this eternal discussion if Edson was really the first one to play that way, because some people say it was Ildofredo Correa, another uh, great drummer at the time, you know, and, and it, so it's Oscar Bolan used to have all these uh, Facebook posts, you know, oh, you know, I found this recording. So this guy played, you know, a few months before. Oh, no, I found the new recording. Yeah. So that's ooh, universal. Now, that's everyone has every society has that like who who did it first who did in yeah. it's part of the it's part of the fun <laughs> we never know you know no but what we do know is that edson machado got the most of the credit for that you know okay. so uh so history goes that he was playing his samba cruzado his crossed samba you know the one that i described mm -hmm. yep and that and then he broke his snare drum head so, you know, he had to keep playing so that he had to ride on a cymbal. And up to that point, Luciano Perroni, you know, of course he had cymbals, but he would play an accent here or there. He would never really ride yeah. on a cymbal. Yeah. And, and Edson Machado, he was listening uh, to the jazz guys, you know, to Max Roach, uh, to, you know, Kenny Clark, to what these guys had been doing in the previous years. So mm -hmm. actually, uh, riding on the symbol wasn't so strange for him. Yeah. And at that point, you know, drummers were playing what became known as uh, bumbu adois, like with that pattern for the feet. And Edson Machado would play that. But he would also, you know, playing with a soloist, he would establish a dialogue. He would, you know, make comments with his bass drum. Hmm. So in a way, he was doing just like, you know, bebop drummers were dropping bombs. He yeah, would really. Stop, he would stop that pattern and, and you know, make his comment. Yeah. So uh, it's great to realize that at that point, in the 50s, uh, of course, we had Bossa Nova, right? And that was part of that whole interest about, you know, new things, modern things. So in 1958, we had uh, João Gilberto recording Chega de Saudade. That's like the first Bossa Nova song. So in 58, he recorded the song uh, Chega de Saudade. In 1959, 
he recorded a full record called, also named Chega de Saudade. And he was playing, you know, his guitar in such a way that drums had to do something different, you know. Uh, drums had to be subtle and soft. And, and so we can imagine, you know, all this going on and, and drummers had to be versatile because if you listen to uh, like Edson Machado in the first Antonio Carlos Jobim record, for instance, uh, the composer of Zafinado Plays, that's the first Antonio Carlos Jobim record. Uh, Edson Machado played something like chak, 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 you know, self contained, mm -hmm. subtle, delicate, you know, yeah. everything that Bosanova was, was asking for. Yeah, but then supporting the music and. He was playing for the music. But yeah. then in that same year, 1963, if you listen to his only recording as a leader, it's called Edson Machado é Samba Novo. You know, it, he goes nuts. You know, it's playing all over the place, very modern, very, very jazzy. Yeah. You know, and, and all of this, I mean, you can go and look on, on the streaming services. It's very easy to find, you know, most of these recordings. So uh, it's funny that drummers had to adapt, you know, to different yeah. situations. And at that time, uh, Edson Machado and, and all the, the other guys, they would go to a place in Rio called the Alley of the Bottles. It was a place with a lot of nightclubs. And, and it got that name because, you know, musicians and guests would leave late at night making noise and disturbing people living nearby. So people from the buildings would throw <laughs> bottles at them, you know. So wow. th that's the Alley of the Bottles. That's funny. So there they would play you know just free crazy ideas and incorporate the jazz thing so it is interesting to see that drummers here were listening to the jazz influence yeah but then at that very moment brazilian music was heavily influencing jazz music in the u.s absolutely yeah right in, in 1962 we had that very famous, memorable concert at uh, Carnegie Hall in New York. And that's when, you know, a lot of the drummers, a lot of musicians, João Gilberto, Antonio Carlos Jobim, uh, you know, all these guys went to New York and then some of them just stayed and started, you know, mm. doing their things there. Yeah. I mean, that is the essence of jazz is to, uh, and I am no expert on jazz, but is to take in all these different influences. I mean, that is what jazz is, is the mixture of all these different cultures. Um, so I think it makes absolute sense. And I love that it went back the other way. And it's just this mutually kind of, it, it just makes everything better. But you kind of have to know too, it sounds like when, when, when he was performing that you could be very s subtle, you could be subdued and play for the music. But then you also need to know when to go go nuts and and have that opportunity late night in the the alleys where you're getting thrown <laughs> bottles thrown at you and stuff. You have to know when to do what. Uh, and it's yeah, that's all very interesting. That that's that was the case with you know many of the drummers of the time. So you know we should mention Milton Banana as well. Milton Banana, mm -hmm. he played uh, he played in that first João Gilberto record in 1959 he also played for the get gilberto record which was a huge success in the us mm -hmm. in 1963 so you know in those recordings he also was like playing for the music if you listen to his uh milton banana trio it's going nuts you know it's so <laughs> crazy and yeah. same thing with like don un roman don un roman and uh, Edson Machado uh, were like the two guys who were really into jazz. So yeah. he played uh, Don Ramon for th that record that Antonio Carlos Jobim made with uh, Frank Sinatra in 1967. You know, so they say, oh, he was playing very soft and, and he had pillows inside his bass drum, you know. But then if you go to his first solo recording, 
1964. You know, it, it's, it's samba, it's Brazilian, but you have all these different things. You know, you could see that he had stylistic references from different places. Like he's mm. playing a lot of the uh, raspadeira, you know, this technique where you play uh, the rim of, of, of the tom and the rim of the snare and get a phlegm out of that. And people say that he got that from Art Blakey. You know, yeah, Art Blakey was, sure. was doing that in jazz and yeah. he would apply the same idea. But in his version, you know, he's using the cross stick to emulate the sound of the tambourine. You know, tak, 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 tak. So he was going somewhere else, you know. So he was just like Luciano Pejoni used to do. He would play the snare drum trying to emulate the sound of the hippiniki, you know. So just just very interesting to see how they were reacting to different things. And then, of course, Don Homon in 1965, went to the U.S., right? So uh, he went on to play with Weather Report, Tony mm-hmm. Bennett, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, you know. So Don Homão and, and Ayrton Moreira, Ayrton is the other guy that we yeah. should discuss next, they sure. both became like ambassadors for Brazilian yeah. drumming in the U.S., you know. They were... Yeah. First and foremost, there were drum kit players, but they realized that in the U.S. they could get jobs playing, uh, you know, playing percussion. And they were playing hand percussion instruments that were common in Brazil, but I believe they were not so known in the U.S. Like, yeah. uh, like the Berimbau, you know, they were like the ambassadors for the Berimbau. Don Romão, Ayrton, and, and then Naná Vasconcelos. Which that's the great way to get, I mean, they obviously got the gig because of their talent, but to have this sort of sound that you don't hear anywhere else and that's being basically imported in and it's it's new and fresh. I mean, as you said, to be ambassadors, those are great ambassadors and they're, I mean, the footwork that can happen with a lot of these guys is also just as impressive as the, as the handwork. I mean, it's 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 almost like a, it's 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 like you said where I love the how you described the net with the timing where you kind of go in and out. Um, it's like you're not constricted by by traditional timing, and I think that applies just as much to your feet. And uh, it, it's just awesome to it's impressive to watch, really. Yeah, it's just like I just thought about you know Bill Bruford's book in his autobiography. He he says. You know, in the 70s, when he started playing with the click, like the metronome, uh, you know, now we have what I call the culture of consistency, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you start playing, like, oh, you have to follow the metronome. And, you know, in 1960, that wasn't really important. I mean, it was just play, play for the music. If you have to speed up, just do it. So exactly, it's not that, you know, we had timing variations uh, with that basic structure. You know, actually in Carnival, if a, a assembly school can keep the same time, the same BPM, that's a good thing. You, you know, you, mm-hmm. you, you get points for that. Yeah. But also, I mean, you cannot be stiff. You have, of course, you, you need that flexibility of the net, you know, to get yeah. the right feel. Yeah. I mean, and it, it raises the question, too. I'm, I'm sure just not even really a question, but a thought about how the evolution of recording and studios and how that, I'm sure, follows, like you just said, where in the in the in the early days, you listen to recordings from the 60s and 70s. And let's say of bands like the Rolling Stones or something like a kind of a, a classic universal band that most people like they are speeding up and slowing down and speeding up and slowing down. And um it's it's neat to hear you talking about how even in your culture that that really did begin to change where I feel like it's like if you're not using a click, you're not doing it right. But that's not the case. You you need to be correct and on. But uh, and then even beyond that, they chop it to the grid nowadays and make it even more perfect. But 
that's got to be difficult, even with modern music, to chop up. Because the, the music in Brazil is very intricate, percussion-wise, where, um, I don't know, uh, you know what I'm saying? Where, like, nowadays in, in modern music, there will be, I mean, literally, they'll put a chop on the bass drum, they'll cut the snare drum, they'll quantize it into a grid. Your music doesn't quite work I mean, I'm sure it does, but it's got very intricate, a lot of nuance where it maybe it doesn't slide and 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 move to the grid quite as as much, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, and and it's funny that you mentioned you know uh, new re- recording technologies because yeah, that's something we can discuss thinking about Ayuto as well. You know, because in the '60s when Ayuto uh, was coming up. Uh, you know, we can think of the Beatles and, and George Martin, uh, Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. You know, people mm-hmm. were trying to to get more complex, you know, to get yeah. because you had then the capability of, you know, multi-track recording of have having, you know, sound uh, layers on top yeah. of each other. You could get more complex. But for Brazilian, the, the drum kit, Actually, uh, you know, at least in samba playing, in, in and Ayuto talks about that, things actually were simplified because in the beginning, you know, we, we discussed uh, uh, the pioneers, they had to play just with a drum kit, all the percussion parts. And now, you know, Ayuto, if you listen to Ayuto's recordings uh, during the 70s, uh, he talks about that. He says, you know, I would simplify what I was doing the drum kit because I knew that I could overdub hmm. some percussion, you know, layers yeah, on top of yeah. that. Same thing if you think about like Wilson das Neves. Wilson das Neves was another great Brazilian master with a very interesting career because he played so many different styles. You know, he played when we had the rock fever in Brazil, he would play rock, but he could always sound Brazilian, you know, just great. And if you listen to uh, you know, more recent recordings he made with like Chico Buarque, you know, good recordings, good sound quality. You can really understand everything that's going on. Uh, Wilson Das Neves would be playing, you know, maybe some hi-hat and the bass drum on B2. Hmm. Throughout the song, hmm. you know, and sure. the other percussion instruments would, you know, Go on top of that. So, yeah. so actually, it's interesting to see how technology, you know, uh, yeah, actually affected the way drummers were recording here. Too. Yeah, but you still want to be able to have that ability to play live because in lot live is not studio, so you need to be able to still do the do everything and create the sounds with your fingers on the drum and all this stuff. But but then switch your brain into the studio and and multi track it, but not lose intensity not lose uh the feel but that's just universal drum uh stuff where in the studio everything's fun and everything's great but really you you still need to keep your <laughs> your live uh you know feel but very cool so i keep just getting off the timeline here so ca- carry on where we wherever we left off um, well we stopped with with ayuto yes. right ayuto yes so uh i said that Don Homon went to the States. Yep. He moved. He, he was there at the concert in 1962. Milton Banana played at that concert. Don Homon played at that concert too. Hmm. And then after that, he got, you know, an invitation to stay in the U.S. And so he moved in 1965. I believe I'm not 100% sure about the dates, but sure. he moved in... 65 in maybe three or four years after that, Ayuto moved to the US. And then, of course, Ayuto played, you know, with Miles, played uh, with Weather Report, with Chikoria and, and Return to Forever. Yeah. But Ayuto was fundamental even before he moved to the States, you know, because he was part of this samba jazz thing here. He had in, with three, uh, uh, with two very cool trios. First, uh, a trio called São Balanço Trio with César Camargo Mariano, and then São Brasa Trio with Hermeto Pascual 
on piano and flute. And then after that, um, he recorded with uh, Quarteto Novo in 1967. And that recording was, you know, any person trying to understand Brazilian instrumental music should listen to that. It's like a ma major reference. Mm. And, and the thing was, you know, in the 50s, we had a figure in Brazil uh, called uh, uh, Luiz Gonzaga. He was the king of Baião, you know, like o rei do Baião. So he came from the northeast and he, he was playing all these rhythms, you know, Baião, Xote, Chachado, rhythms from the northeast that he made popular because he was huge on radio at the time, you know. And the drummers at the time, uh, many of the drummers would not touch that. Like Edson Machado never played, you know, the rhythms from the northeast. Don Romão wasn't playing that as, as well. And, you know, and, and we believe that they were thinking like, oh, this is music for the masses. You know, yeah. it's like uh, it doesn't have the subtlety and, and the special sure. qualities that samba and samba jazz, you know, yeah. have. So Ayrton did embrace those rhythms. And, and especially because Hermeto Pascual, who was playing with him in, in some Braza trio, he, uh, you know, Hermeto also was very fond of, of those uh, rhythms from the Northeast. So if you listen to that Quarteto Novo recording, you know, it's just wonderful because Ayrton is playing all these rhythms from the Northeast, and, and, but he plays that in odd times, you know, because mm -hmm. it's very yeah. intricate. And and he plays sometimes just the bass drum and the hi hat, and he he's playing some hand percussion instrument, and then he throws uh, the percussion instrument, gets the sticks, and keeps playing. So it's it's just cool, you know, just it very cool. very modern. And if you keep listening to Edmeto Pascual, it's just you know insane how good the music is, and yeah. and it get, it's it's using all these rhythms in those crazy ideas from the Northeast as well. Hmm. And I think now we're almost, you know, in the late sixties, seventies, you're now in the world of this isn't 1917 or 1920. We have video and there are examples that people can see of this stuff, which I think is awesome, which I would love if you have a couple extra minutes before this gets released for you to send me a couple links sure. to, to maybe some videos or some examples that I can put in the description because, um, there are a lot of people in America who are very familiar with this stuff, but if there's people like me who are really learning a lot of this for the first time from someone like, you know, really an expert like you, send a couple things over. I'll put them in the, uh, let's say, the beginner's guide. Sure. You know, sure. the Brazilian drumming you know, and if, music even, guide. Even Luciano Perroni, or from the first generation, you know, he, uh, he passed away in 2001, I think. You know, he mm. had a very long career. Sure. So... I mean, we don't have a lot of material with him, but yeah. I remember, you know, there's something from like late 80s, maybe 85 or 86, and yeah. it was just a TV show. You know, someone uploaded that into YouTube. I'm not even sure if it's still there. I'll, I'll look it yeah. up. Sure. You realize now how important, I see that a lot with these drum videos, is you realize how important that one news story from 1986 is that featured a drummer that without that, and then someone somehow found it and put it on YouTube. You realize how important it is after when, when you realize, oh, my gosh, that's the only one we have. That's the only, you know, video we have of this drummer. And um, I, I think that's great. So, um, all right. Well, I think we're, we're getting close to time here. Would you want to bring it on home with? I mean, you like as you said, you said you're worried about the traditions of people not really carrying it on maybe as much as, uh, you know, if things are changing from being less traditional um you know which i guess is something to be concerned of everyone feels that way i think sometimes about jazz isn't quite as studied as much in schools as it used to be but in my experience doing this podcast there's tons of people who love um jazz and i i, I from from meeting brazilian folks on online there's a lot of passionate people but um hopefully people listening to this will will do more research and listen to what you're saying and, and that passion for Brazilian traditional 
drumming and the drum kit and music will grow. Yeah, sure. And, you know, so we discussed the first generation, the second generation, and we have modern yeah, players absolutely. now, you know, so yeah. it's, it's, I, I worry about the future, but we have to say that we do have, you know, wonderful players right now. So yeah. we're still going solid and strong. It's just that, you know, some of our young generations, uh, you know, are not paying attention to what came before. But we do have some, you know, like in the book, I mentioned uh, Ramon Montagner, you know, a dear friend of mine, uh, Edu Ribeiro, uh, you know, people nowadays with awesome technique. I mean, they're take, really taking things a step further, you know. Yeah. And I really have to say, you know, I, I should mention uh, the drummers who played with Hermeto Pascual. You know, in the book I mentioned Márcio Bahia, Zé Eduardo Nazário, and Nene. You know, and they they really they could take things a step further. You know, because they had yeah. Hermeto was doing all this you know crazy uh, musical universe. You know, with uh, odd times and and different things going on all the time. And these musicians, they had. Uh, you know, not only the technique, but the open mind to go with their method, you know, and, yeah. and Zé Eduardo Nazario, who was my teacher, actually, I, I have, I'm proud to say, uh, Zé Eduardo Nazario and Nene also performed with Egberto Gismonti. So these two names, Hermeto Pascual and Egberto Gismonti, are paramount if you want to you know, understand what Brazilian, modern Brazilian playing is nowadays. Sure. And, and, and as I said, you know, we have these new guys with awesome technique because when we think about, you know, samba and pl fast samba, uh, it's very common that we're going to, you know, instead of playing all the 16th notes, we're going to just break it up. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to tap, 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 tap. You're going to let it breathe a little bit. But some of these new drummers, you know, no matter how fast the song is, they can play every 16th note. Like, yeah. as I said, like Ramon Montagner, my dear friend, he has this push and pull technique, you know. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, Edu Ribeiro, you know, different technique, but also Celso de Almeida, Kiko Freitas, which is like nowadays, I guess, maybe the figure who's really well known around the planet. He's been playing with João Bosco for many days. He has a great book out on, on um, Hudson music. And, and he has what he says is uh, action and reaction. Ação mm. e reação. So like he can throw the stick and get three strokes. And then he pulls and get a fourth stroke. Wow. So he's going for the sound of Hepiniki so that same thing that Luciano Perroni was doing with two hands, he can do with one hand playing the right symbol. You know, so it's it's crazy. And it yeah. sounds so good. People keep evolving. And it makes me think too that you saying, you know, you're a little worried about the future generation, it kind of makes you wonder if the first generation was worried when the second generation was coming up. You know what I mean? You you everyone's kind of worried if the next generation is going to be doing it, but you know. Hopefully it turns out that something really cool comes out of it. And, and it sounds like these guys are like getting faster and better and stronger. And um, it's just pretty neat. Um, so, well, I think this has been awesome. I am so far out of my comfort zone in, <laughs> but I think I've, I've learned a lot from you. I hope I, you know, I, I followed along. And if you, like I said, can share a couple things on, that I can share on, on, in the description for folks to, to um, kind of, get a taste of what, you know, a little bit more of the, the top, top classic examples that people should listen to. I I'll share that. And I think that would be really neat. Um, and then, um, Daniel is kind enough. He said he could hang out for a couple minutes after we finish and we'll record a Patreon bonus episode. And Daniel, I think I would, I'd like to talk to you about once we wrap up and do the next episode would be, um, what it was like to work with Matt and to, to consolidate all of your information on the history of the drum kit in Brazil and kind of get it, uh, you know, sort of pared down into a chapter of a book and how you sort of selected what was 
fitting and how you made it universal for everyone to kind of understand because it's different when you can talk and speak it to someone like you're doing now but um i'm i'm sure it's really cool and then maybe we can talk about the book a little more in that and uh folks can can check that out as well which just to mention again it's the cambridge companion to the drum kit i'll put a link to it in the description um very cool every chapter is something different and that's from uh, matt brennan who kind of again got us connected so um yeah Daniel, is there anything you want to plug at the end here? Maybe tell people some recordings you've been doing or where Uh, they can find you or anything like that. Cool. There's a book. uh, You know, I, my first drum teacher back in 1984 was Jaime Pladeval, this guy here. And, and I had the pleasure of, you know, first I had a drum set quartet with Jaime. It was a, a very cool project called Casa de Marimbondo, and we have a record, uh, you know, all the streaming services should have it. It's a very cool record. And then a few years ago, we wrote this book together, and it's called In the World of Drumming, a Brazilian Perspective. This, mm. this is Portuguese, but we have an English version uh, cool. available on, on Hudson Music's website. So if, you wanna, right. if anyone is interested, can yeah. check it out. I'll share that as well, which is awesome. So, yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, Daniel, thank you for taking the time to be here today and share all this great information uh, to people. Uh, I can speak for myself that I've learned a ton and it really puts music and drumming into perspective and and it kind of expands my, um, I guess, as an American guy, you kind of think, I think everyone sort of thinks of their own culture uh, for themselves, but I'm I'm really glad to have you on the show and kind of get out of that American and Europe, uh, European type type episodes, which I do a lot. So I'm I'm honored to have you on here and, and thank you for your time. Cool, thank you so much. One last thing, yes. uh, you mentioned Matt Brainin, and yeah. you know I really should mention Daniel Akita and also Joe Pignato. And actually, this is the cover of the book. You know, so the book had three editors and. Sure. Actually, Joe Pignato was the one who invited me, you know, if, if I would be interested in submitting a chapter. So my shout out for them, too. Great. Thank you for doing that. Like I, I was not aware of that. So I, I appreciate you doing that. And uh, yeah, and thank you for everyone. If you want to hear the bonus episode we're about to record, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, click the Patreon link, and then uh, you'll hear the bonus episode. So, Daniel, thanks for being here. Thank you.